last number of days, we've looked at various aspects of electric charge, what charge is, how things get charge, i.e. induction or conduction. Yesterday, we just started, didn't get very far with it, but we just started measuring the force that acts between two charges, the force of attraction or repulsion that acts between two charges. We described an experiment called the torsion balance experiment that finds for us the relationship between the force and those charges and the distance that separates those charges. Anybody remember what the word torsion means? Torsion means twisting. So you can, you can call it the twisting balance experiment if you want, which might help you to remember what's actually happening here. We have a string that's hanging from the top of an apparatus. That string has hanging from it a little rod. And on the end of that rod, we have an object. On the other end of the rod, we have another object. We'll call this object down here Q1. It's charged with whatever charge, however many coulombs it is, we're going to call it Q1. Now we're going to bring another charge we're going to call Q2 nearby. That's going to cause either a force of attraction or repulsion. Attraction if they're opposites, repulsion if they're like charges. We don't really care what happens here, whether they attract or repel. The bottom line is there's going to be movement. As a result of that movement, that string will twist the twisting balance experiment, the torsion balance experiment. The amount of twisting in the string is going to represent what for us? What does that tell us? Think of the swing set, right? The more it twists, the more it turns, the bigger the force. So the amount of twisting is going to measure for us the force. You guys remember using in junior high those spring scales? Did you guys ever use those in junior high, those spring scales? Really what, the way that that measured force, and that's what it was doing, was measuring force, is by looking at the amount of stretching of the spring. So if, if the amount of stretching of a spring can represent a force, then the amount of twisting of a string could represent force. That's exactly what we're doing here, is using the amount that the string twists to find for us the electric force of either attraction or repulsion. So we're able to measure the force. Now, we're also able to measure the distance that separates these two charges. That's the easy one. That's the value of R, the separation distance, and she's a ruler for that. Now, we need to measure Q1 and Q2 as well. We could measure Q1 and Q2 fairly easily, but Coulomb in his time couldn't do that directly. So what he did is said, look, I got a charge. I'm going to call it Q. I don't know what it is in Coulombs, but I'm going to call it Q. If I touch that charge Q against something that's neutral, then they're going to balance out to be a half Q and a half Q. So I've just changed Q into a half Q. And now I'm going to touch half Q with something that's neutral and make it a quarter Q and a quarter Q. And now I'm going to touch a quarter Q to something that's neutral and make it an eighth Q and so on. So Coulomb is able to change the value of Q without really knowing what the value of Q is. Keeps on touching it against something that's neutral, keeps cutting the charge that he has in half. So he's able to determine not necessarily the exact value of Q1 and Q2, but the relative values of Q1 and Q2. In other words, he's able to manipulate them, even if he doesn't know what the values are in Coulombs. Now, he does three experiments, if you remember from yesterday. In the first experiment, he gets results that look like this. Force versus Q1 gives me a straight line. What would be my manipulated variable in this experiment? Without knowing the details so much of the experiment, just by looking at the graph, you know the manipulated variable. What is it? Yes, Q1 is the manipulated variable. The manipulated variable is always on the x-axis, always. Okay, you do a lab, you're going to do one on Friday, actually, another simulation on Friday. The manipulated variable will be whatever variable I tell you to put on the x-axis. The responding variable will be whatever variable I tell you to put on the y-axis, right, which in this case is force. And my control variables, the important control variables at least, there might be 100 control variables, but the important ones would be what? Emily? Q2 and R. We got to change only one variable, and we're changing Q1, so we can't change Q2 or R, because if we do, then what caused the increase in F? If we change Q2 and Q1, was it Q1 or was it Q2? Or was it some kind of combination? Change one at a time. Now, when Coulomb does this experiment, he gets a relationship that looks like this. F is related to Q1. In other words, as Q1 increases, F will increase. As Q2, Q1 decreases, F will decrease. This is like 
you guys know for a straight line graph, we get y equals mx plus b, right? Y is related to x. Or in other words, y is equal to a constant, the slope of the graph, times x. So we'd say here, well, f is related to q1. f is equal to the slope of that graph times q1, right? Okay, we won't get there quite yet, but just know that right now it's re they're related. f and q1 are related to one another. Okay, let's look at the second one here. This one's f versus q2. My manipulated variable here would be what? Now, what's my manipulated variable in this experiment? Q2, good. What's my responding variable, somebody in this experiment? Somebody else here. Jacob, I don't know if I've asked you. Yeah. Hey. Can you respond? What is it? Yes, the force is the responding. What appears on my y-axis is the responding variable, right? Um, and my control variables, there's two of them that are the really important ones here. Um, Tyler, what are my control variables in this experiment? Q1 and R. Good. Now, if we find the relationship between F and Q2, it should be the same relationship we had between F and Q1. Make sense? All right. One more. The third one should look like this. Plot F versus R. And this graph, this graph looks different here. What's my manipulated variable on this one? Robbie, what's my manipulated variable here? Good. Um, Mary, what's my responding variable here? Good. And my control variables? Sorry, what's one control variable? Q1 and the other one is? Good. If I'm changing R, then you've got to keep Q1 and Q2 the same in order to see what effect R has on F. You can see as R goes up, F goes down here. In fact, this relationship, it's hard to tell just by looking at the graph. With the naked eye, this relationship could be a 1 over R relationship, or it could be a 1 over R squared. It's pretty difficult to distinguish the two with the naked eye. In this case, it turns out to be a 1 over R squared relationship. You're going to have to trust me on that. It's what it turns out to be mathematically. Now, Coulomb takes these three relationships, F is related to Q1, F is related to Q2, and F is related to 1 over R squared, and puts them together. And he ends up getting a relationship that looks like this. F is related to Q1 times Q2 over R squared. Now remember, if F is related to this, it's got to be equal to something times this. So let's replace this. Let's replace that proportionality sign with a constant. We're going to call it K. This would be like if you had a graph of Y versus X and it was a straight line you would replace the proportionality constant with m, the slope of the graph. So f is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. This is the electric force of attraction or repulsion, measured in newtons, that acts between two charges, measured in coulombs, that are separated a certain distance in meters apart from one another. K, the only other variable that we have in this equation that finds for us this relationship, is a constant. We call it Coulomb's constant. And the value of Coulomb's constant is 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Good news is that number's on our data sheet, so we don't have to have it memorized. You're going to use it enough times that you probably will remember it. But if you don't, oh well. Check your data sheet. Now, this is pretty much where we finished off yesterday. But I think before you left yesterday, I did ask you one more question. And that question was, does this remind you of anything from Physics 20? Does this remind you of any law or equation or rule or concept that we did in Physics 20? Is there any little sense of deja vu here when we do this? Yes? Calvin, what is it? What does it remind you of? Yes. It's Newton's law of universal gravitation. 
Newton's law of universal gravitation provides for us the force of gravity that acts between two masses a certain distance apart, not the electric force that acts between two charges a certain distance apart. But they're very analogous. They're not the same thing. They're not. But they're very, very analogous. Okay? Um, F would be the gravitational force, M1 and M2 would be the masses, and R would be the separation distance. G would be the gravitational constant. Let's see if anybody remembers what this is. If you don't, like, join the crowd, right? Like, that's a number that you haven't seen since possibly first semester of Physics 20 last year. So if you don't remember it, that's absolutely fine. But I'm curious if anybody does remember it. Anybody that maybe had it last semester or something? It is on your data sheet as well. Big G is 6.67. Remember this one? Times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per, not Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. These two equations look remarkably similar. They look remarkably similar. We call these equations both inverse square relationships. They're both inverse square relationships. That means that the force, in both cases, the force is inversely related to the square of the distance. Does that make sense? Two relationships are the same. Two relationships, two completely different relationships, but that happen to be the same relationship, if that makes sense. Now, let me cover this up for a second here, because I don't want to give everything away. One of these forces is bigger than the other. There are four fundamental forces in the universe. Four. Just four. Like, we talked about so many forces last year in Physics 20. The vast, vast majority of those forces were not fundamental forces. The vast majority of those forces came from other things, like friction, for instance. Well, that was important, but it wasn't fundamental. It came from other forces. Yeah. Gravity, on the other hand, we talked about, that is a fundamental force. So is the electromagnetic force, or the electric force, we'll call it. So is, we mentioned this earlier, the strong nuclear force, and the fourth one is the weak nuclear force. Of the four fundamental forces, we may think gravity is the strongest, because that's the one we observe, right? If I stand up on a desk here, and I jump off the desk, like, you, can, you know what's going to happen to me, because you've seen this a million times before, right? Things fall because of gravity. That's got to be a big force, right? Yeah. It is. Like, gravity is big, but it's the smallest of the four. The gravity force is smaller than, than, than the electric force. Now, this isn't the reason why, but it's a good way for us to remember which one is bigger. Coulomb's law uses a value of k that is 8.99 times 10 to the positive 9. Newton's law of universal gravitation uses a value of g that is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. If you get a value of k that's 10 to the 20 times bigger than the value of g, then odds are that the electric force will be bigger than the gravitational force. Does that make sense? Certainly, certainly, in the context of an atom on an atomic level, the electric force will always be bigger than gravity. The electric force that keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus is much bigger than the force of gravity that acts between the electron and the nucleus. They're both there, but the electric force is way bigger. Even on a bigger scale, the electric force is often bigger. Last one, uh, what about direction? Well, listen, we know that gravity is always going to be an attractive force, right? Always attractive. So gravity is attractive, whereas the Coulomb's law force or the electric force can be attractive or repulsive. Now, why that difference? Why the difference between direction of force? Gravity is always attractive. The electric force can be attractive or repulsive. Well, that comes down to one fundamental thing. What causes gravity? Gravity. 
mass. What causes electric force? Charge. How many types of mass are there? One. How many types of charge are there? Two. All right, when you have two types of charge, it leaves open the possibility of two types of force, attractive or repulsive. If we had two types of mass, maybe we could have attractive or repulsive gravity as well. I mean, that's a pretty hypothetical argument because we don't have two types, but if we did, maybe it would be attractive or repulsive as well. Make sense? All right. Let's do an example question here for us, okay? Okay, guys, please. So your example says a metal sphere with a positive charge, with a positive charge of 5.5, gentlemen, and a mass of 2.5 is separated from an identical metal sphere with a negative charge. I'm going to draw attention to this, positive and negative. That might become important. Maybe, maybe not. Separated by a distance of 5 centimeters. I'm definitely going to circle that so I don't forget to convert that to meters. Mark and a set of physics 20 tests this morning. Okay, somebody had, one person in the class had 100% going into the test. 100 on everything. Assignments, quizzes thus far this year. Made a mistake on a test. You know what the mistake was? Converting centimeters to meters. 0 .0, 0 0.5 centimeters is not 0.5 meters. It's 0 0.05 meters. Right? Even somebody who thus far has been, at least on their evaluations, has been perfect so far in physics 20, can still make that mistake of converting centimeters to meters incorrectly. Determine the electric force on the positive charge, the electric force on the negative charge, and what's the acceleration of the positive charge. Let's write down some givens here. We have uh, charge 1, we'll call it positive 5.50 times 10 to the negative 7 coulombs, and charge 2 we'll call negative uh, 2.00 times 10 to the negative 7 coulombs. I'm going to say mass 1 is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms. So mass 1, charge 1, and then we don't know the mass of charge number 2. That's fine. We do know the distance that separates them. R is 0 0.050 meters, not 0.5, 0 0.05. And we want to find F. Now, does it matter that we called Q1 and Q2 the ways that we did? Or could we have reversed those? Yeah. What's 1 times 2? Two? 2. What's 2 times 1? 2. So it doesn't matter what order we multiply two numbers together, right? If we reverse these charges, it makes no difference. Let's calculate the force now. I get KQ1, Q2 over R squared. And K is, as you know, or at least as you will know if you look on your data sheet, 8.99 times 10 to the 9. Times it by Q1, which is 5.5 times 10 to the negative 7 times it by Q2, which is 2.0 times 10 to the negative 7, over R, which is 0 0.050 squared. Is that good? Any mistakes there? Yeah, a little bit of a trick question, actually, because I do actually want to do it the way that I've done it up here. Okay, but I, but I want to make a point that you do have a negative charge. That becomes important sometimes, but not in determining the magnitude of the force. Look at my equation. What do those two little vertical lines mean? Absolute value. I don't want you to ever sub in the sign of a charge into an equation. Got it? Mm -hmm. Here's why. If you sub in a negative for that, let's do that just for a second. We're going to get a negative answer there. The temp your temptation is going to be that a negative answer means the force is to the left or south or down, right? Because the way we've used positive and negative up until this point in physics 20 and physics 30, positive and negative means direction. Positive and negative means something different here. So let's not try to mix and match two different sign conventions. Stick with one. For us, in an equation, negative will always mean direction. If it means something different, don't use it. Now, that negative is important in determining whether it's an attractive or repulsive force, but we'll look at that after we calculate the magnitude of the force. So remember that. Remember that. Don't ever, in any equation that we do this year, including this one, sub in the sign of a charge. Got it? No signs for charge. No signs. Okay, let's calculate this now. Let's say uh, 8.99 times 10 to the 9, times 5.5 times 10 to the negative 7, times, drop the sign of the 2, 
2 times 10 negative 7. So this equals, and then let's divide by 0 0.05 squared. We get a force here of 0 0.39556. which will round to 0 0.396. Why did I write down the unrounded number there? Why was that? Why did I think that might be important? Yeah, later on, I got to do another calculation later on, right? And if I'm doing another calculation and I use that number, I need to go to all of the significant digits that I have there, right? Yep. Wait, it's the second part of the question where you use your number. No, use your unrounded number. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. If it's the second part of a question, which we're about to do, you're going to use the unrounded number. Now, this force that I just calculated, 0.396, which force is this? Is this the force on the positive or the force on the negative? It's both, yeah. It's both because, as you know, way back in physics 20, if object A applies a force on object B, then object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. So the magnitude of the force, the absolute value of the force, is 0 0.396. 0 0.396 towards A, 0 0.396 towards B. Got it? All right, how do I find the acceleration now? Got the force, how do I find the acceleration? Mass. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to say f, uh, f is equal to m times a, or rearrange it and say a is equal to f over m. So when Luke Skywalker has the force, but a young Luke in A New Hope doesn't really know what to do with the force, he goes to see Yoda, and Yoda teaches him what to do with the force, right? In other words... Once the force is with Luke, Yoda needs to teach him to use the force, how to use the force. What would Yoda say right here? Well, once the force is with you, divide it by mass. So, the force needs to be with you. Then, divide it by mass. Divide the force by the mass, you will, says Yoda. And when we do that, by the way, I'm using the mass of charge 1 because I'm looking for the acceleration of charge 1, right? If I was looking for the acceleration of charge 2, I'd have to divide by the mass of charge 2. Those accelerations could be different, right? There's no law that says acceleration on object 1 has to be the same as the acceleration of object 2. It's the forces that need to be the same. When I drop an apple towards the Earth, the force on the apple is the same as the force on the earth, right? Mm -hmm. But the apple moves a lot more than the earth does because the apple is lighter. So the forces are the same, the accelerations aren't. We have to divide the force that's the same for both of them by the mass of whatever it is that we're trying to find the acceleration of. So divide these two, we get uh, that divided by 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 gives us 158. Easy, right? This is Je this is Jedi school, Jedi Academy, right? Once the force is with you, the force needs to be with you. And then once the force is with you, what did Yoda say? Well, he didn't exactly say that. He would say he would Yoda wouldn't say divide it by mass. He would say divide the ma force by the mass, you will. Divide the force by the mass, you will. And you get 158 meters per second squared. So look at worksheet number six for now, only questions one to four. You're going to do a couple more in a few minutes after we another, do another example, but for now, just those four, please. One more example, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Number two says, uh, two spheres in the previous example, the one we just did a minute ago, are momentarily touched together, separated by the original separation distance of five centimeters. What's the force now? Isn't it the same? Like, it's the same two objects. What's the difference? So we touch them together. So what? What does that do when you touch two charges together? What does it do? 
it transfers the electrons. So the charges are going to be different now, right? What does the charge become on them, Enrique? You don't have to tell me an exact number. But generally, if I touch one to another one, touch them together, what happens? They're going to balance out, right? So what we want to do is take the two charges that we had in the last question, which is positive 5.5 times 10 to negative 7. Let's add to that the second charge, which was negative 2 times 10 to negative 7. And let's divide that by 2. Uh, 5.5 times 10 to minus 7 plus, or let's just subtract, 2 times 10 to minus 7 divided by 2. We get a value of uh, 1.75 times 10 to negative 7 coulombs. Now, that's a charge on both of these ones now, right? Well, now it's just a straightforward question. Let's say the force is equal to k, q1, q2, over r squared. 8.99 times 10 to the 9 times 1.75 times 10, times 10 to the negative 7 times 1.75 times 10 to the negative 7. And the distance is 0 0.05 meters again. Now, the question seems almost exactly like the last question, but it's actually almost completely different because the charges are different. As soon as I touch them together, it makes it a completely different question, completely different problem. Okay, let's ca calculate this now. Let's say 8.99 times 10 to the 9 times 1.75 times 10 to the negative 7 times... 1.75 times 10 to negative 7, and let's divide that by 0 0.05 squared. We get a value of 0 0.110. The force between them is 0 0.110 newtons. It's an attractive force. Of point, um, sorry, it's not an attractive force, is it? If they balanced out, it's going to be a, a repulsive force. Says what's the electric force, not the magnitude. It says what's the electric force. So we should include direction. We don't know whether it's right or left, but we do know that it's a repulsive force because they're like charges after they touched, that is.